Well, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, DDEX webinar, um, where we are going to be talking about uh, classical music metadata and uh, how we are managing and assisting um, companies operating in, in that area of the music business to communicate that information. My name is uh, Mark Isherwood, uh, and I, along with my colleague Niels Rump, uh, make up part of the Secretariat for DDEX. Um, I will uh, give you a very, very short introduction to DDEX, uh, but also then explain the challenges there are with regard to classical music metadata. And then Niels will talk uh, in more detail about how um, DDEX is going about uh, its standards to ensure that communicating that data can be effective. Um, we very much um, ask you to ask questions if you wish to, either by uh, going onto the chat or by opening your microphone as we're quite a small group, that, that's much easier to manage. So as I said, I'm going to very, very quickly introduce DDEX, but then move on to explaining some of the challenges that exist uh, around metadata for uh, classical music. So, as you all know, uh, the digital music market is very much a high numbers and a low value game, a very, very high number of transactions, uh, each of which is uh, worth a very small amount of money. Um, and therefore, um, and because of those volumes in particular, uh, any manual intervention uh, throughout the process really is, is very expensive. And so DDEX was really set up um, 16 years ago to reduce the need for manual intervention um, through the standardization uh, of very el various elements of that communication process. And the three elements that we focus on in order to provide that efficiency is, first of all, the message format. Um, that is the order in which data about a particular business transaction uh, should appear in a computer message and the links between those various different data items um, so that um, when the uh, message is received, it can be understood by um, the recipient uh, and they can act upon it accordingly. The second element is what we call choreographies. Uh, and this is essentially about how and when messages should actually be uh, exchanged and the trigger points that may exist um, that require a message to be sent. And then lastly, the protocols, the message protocols as the actual mechanisms by which the uh, messages are actually exchanged between business partners. Um, up until relatively recently, most of that has been through the use of secure FTP sites, but increasingly DDEX is moving and standardizing um, the exchange of information using web services, which is much more efficient and does not involve as much human intervention. We now have uh, a significant number of families of standards, um, which in one way or another pretty much cover every aspect of um, the sorts of business transactions that exist between the various different types of companies that operate uh, in the whole ecosystem. So we have standards that uh, collect, help collect data in the studio, uh, ensure that gets into the value chain, and then various different standards um, that are uh, designed for specific circumstances um, between different types of um, uh, business partners within the overall ecosystem. There is a lot of commonality within each of these standards. Um, although they are set out in slightly different ways, you will find there are a number of building blocks within them um, that are common throughout all of the standards. But we're focusing today purely on the exchange of information about classical music. So, first of all, you might say that, well, um, 
uh, and certainly we we would we, we would say that classical mu metadata is uh, much more complex than other music very often for pop music all you need is the name of the band and the title of the song um, when it comes to classical music you may not need all of this information because it will depend on the circumstances and the, the actual type of music that, that is is being used um, but you might need the name of the orchestra, the soloist, conductor, composer, the main instrument, if it's a concerto, um, as there are very often many movements within a classical uh, piece, the name of the movement, if it exists, titles of, of concertos, and, and nicknames or, or, or names that uh, works become known by. So, for example, um, on the popular uh, pop music item this the simple information is breathing by Kate Bush that's sufficient for most people to make a choice to listen to something or not if you look at something like the the choral symphony by uh, Beethoven symphony number no. nine there's a whole lot of information there there isn't even room to put it on the slide um, and so you can see the the juxtaposition here between um, popular music metadata and classical music metadata and there are a number of reasons for this. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, there are many different structures around cl classical music. You may have multi-movement uh, multi concertos or symphonies or, or other pieces, or you might at the other extreme have a very short and simple leader which, which stands on its own. And then probably the most complex of all are, are operas, which have uh, a whole range of different movements um, uh, within them. There's also potentially multiple identifiers for classical music works. Some of them will have ISWC, certainly those that are in copyright. Um, some classical works that are out of copyright also has, have ISWCs. But in addition, there are opus numbers, which are usually uh, chronological numbers given to pieces as they're composed. Or there might be, um, as, as with Bach, for example, um, catalogue numbers that are uh, um, assigned to them by musicologists to help with the identification. And the other thing is that the core terminology can differ different or vary by, by language. So if we look at the example here um, of one movement from the, um, uh, the, the Four Seasons, um, in English uh, it's concerto uh, number one, uh, obviously in German, it, it, it is uh, violin concert number one, uh, and in Italian, although it says concerto, it's numero uno. And the same applies to everything else. The key of the piece is expressed in a different way in different languages. Even to some extent, the opus and um, uh, musicologist numbers are expressed in a slightly different way. Certainly titles uh, here obviously spring is in, is a different word in different languages. Um, the numbering of the movement may be done in a slightly different way uh, and and again keys are uh, also expressed in in a different way. So you have it on the one hand this significant, um, uh, complexity to the way in which uh, metadata has to be used to describe classical music. On the other hand, um, if you look at um, 2019 in the US, with a market of um, over $11 billion, only 1% of that um, was in respect of classical music. So, um, with the complexity on the one hand and the relatively small market, it's very important that there is efficiency in expressing meta or providing metadata about classical music um, so that, that the communication can be really, really efficient. So those rules need to be very easy to understand, easy to implement, and also work even if all the data is not always available. It also needs to be possible for companies that are not dealing in classical music at all to actually be able to ignore them. And so um, in the coming months, 
Um, DDEX is about to publish a version 4.3 of its electronic release notification message suite, which has a number of improvements. One of these is the handling of immersive audio, which is becoming more and more common. How you also handle uh, what are known as short, so um, the use of music snippets in TikTok videos, for example, along with a number of other uh, improvements. Along with the ERN messages itself are what we call release profiles, and that will include a set of rules for the communication of classical music um, and, and a num number of other improvements. So that is something to look out for. Uh, and I'm now going to hand over to Niels, who will explain all of those rules in a lot more detail. Over to you, Niels. Thank you very much, Mark, for, for that introduction. And uh, I'd like to talk about the rules that we are now establishing for the communication of classical music. Um, we've had rules in the past, but as Mark has said, the classical world or the classical market is much smaller than the one for the pop music therefore the, the the drive to deal with classical music has always been significantly less than the drive to deal with, with popular music to some extent that has changed um because i think the the handling of popular music has become much more embedded using the ddex standard so there is a little bit more more room if you like to to handle classical music and we're now changing and updating those rules, and I just want to um, explain those to you. As Mark has said, there are lots of different data points that you need to consider when talking about classical music. You need to think about what's the musical form, what's the instrumentation, who are the composers or who's the composer, who are the contributors, not just the orchestra, but the conductor also potentially any soloists. Sometimes you have a choir or multiple choirs involved in a piece of music. And then the, the structure, as Mark has said, is it a concerto, is it a symphony? Does it have movements? Uh, does it not have movements? Are there areas in there or whatever it may be? And you need to consider that both, all of those uh, two, four, five pieces of, of data with respect to display, you want to make sure that consumers actually can see the data so that they know what they're buying or streaming or looking at and, and listening to. But you also need that for catalog management. You need to make sure that a, a DSP can put up not only the pieces of music, but they may also want to put up a page for Beethoven or Bach or, or whomever the composer may be, or uh, um, something by a specific conductor or something by a specific um, orchestra, those kind of things you, you may all want to collate and make available together because that's very much like somebody likes to listen to a specific band, somebody might, might like to listen to the Vienna, Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, for example, or other orchestras. And then I think even more than for classic, uh, for popular music, um, ancillary auxiliary data is quite interesting and quite, quite important. Um, different key signatures, different um, key notes, those kind of uh, uh, harmonic um, stuff is much more important, as you can see from the titles of classical music. Maybe that is something that actually can help a DSP to not only display, but actually use artificial intelligence to make recommendations to users and so forth. So it's this kind of data about these kind of topics that we need to bring together and make it so that it's simple and easy to and understandable and simple and easy to implement. And that's what we're trying to do. So let's start with the um, orchestral um, symphony by Beethoven, Ode to Joy. Um, to display, what you need to display, for most classical works, it's kind of common to have the name of the composer, then the, the main um, concerto, for example, and then the movement. 
So you need to have the, the, the Ludwig van Beethoven Symphony Number no. 9 in D minor, Opus 124, fourth movement, finale, and then you may have a uh, nickname, O to Joy, for example. But what you also need to, dis to be able to dis display to um, consumers are the contributors. In this case, an orchestra, a choir, four soloists, and one conductor. If you want to put that all onto a little small piece of uh, landscape, uh, um, real estate on your mobile phone to, to display that, well, good luck with that. You need to be able to give the DSP both the, the, the full information as well as the individual pieces of information so that they can piece the things together so that it makes sense for their audience, for their device, for their um, layout. So that's what this tries to do. I'm not sure that that's the best way to do it. But to be honest, if I see this, and if I know something about classical music, I'm pretty sure I know uh, what I'm listening. I can't say whether it's the, uh, the, the, the finale or any of the other three movements, because um, I don't know whether Hedda Harper is a, is a conductor or or a soloist, in this case it's a soloist, so it's the finale, but that I can't see, but at least um, I have a fair amount of information from that, a little piece of um, display there. So as I said, what we need to be able to, to provide is the display data as well as the raw data. The display data is basically a single string that contains the title, to be considered the best by the record company. The record company has created the information. Um, their, their artists know how they want to have this stuff displayed, whether they want full stops or slashes or semicola between the different parts. That's that's fine, that's, that's up to them, but it's one string. Usually, composer's last name, title of work, title of movement, like this. And then you would want to have the, the raw data, the last name of the composer, the title of the work, the sequence number of the movement, and the title of the movement, so that the DSP can then compile it as they see fit for their platform. And they can make it like this from that data. It's the finale Ode of Joy from Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 9 in D minor. It's the same information, but differently displayed um, for consumers. And frankly, if that little black dot um, that, or, or square that I showed you earlier would show this rather than the other bit, I think it would even be better. And in order to allow a DSP that deals with both kinds of platforms where you have room and where you don't have room, the rule that we've basically said is a record company should try to provide both, both in a string as well as in the individual components. But that's not enough. We need to provide three titles for each of those works, at least if we're talking about a hierarchical work. The first is the display title. I've already shown that to you. That's the, the full title, uh, and for, for hierarchical works, it would be composer, the work name, and the movement name. And for non-hierarchical works, well, there's obviously no, no movement there, so you just have the, the work itself. And that wouldn't typically include the opus and catalog uh, number. But as I show you later on, um, that information you would also uh, provide in separate data, not just in, in part of a title, but actually as, uh, as just the number so that people uh, will see that as well. So, for the Ode to Joy, you would have this kind of string. And what I'm not showing here is, is, is the display title text and display title. That's a rule that we have for all kinds of music uh, to deal with subtitles. Um, the same rules that apply to, to popular music applies here as well. So there's nothing, nothing new here. So what about this formal title thing? Well, that's the name of the movement. No composer name, no nothing, just the title of the movement and the, the movement number. So that would be number four, O to Joy. On its own, 
not really helpful. Well, to, in the ode of joy, it might actually be helpful because if you know classical music, you know what you're talking about. But if it's just number three, uh, Adagio, well, that is no use to anybody unless you also know the uh, what we call the grouping title. I'll come to that in a second. But note that there is a slight change to what the current profile says. The current profile says that this formal title should be, again, the full title in a formalized way, whereas the display title could be more colloquial. The formal title would be the full full title in a, in the most structured way. We've gone away from that because the combination of formal title and grouping title will give you that. There is no need to repeat it in the formal title. So the grouping title, that will then be the, the title of the parent work, if there is one, if we're just talking about um, um, a, a lead, a, a Schumann lead or something like that, you would not um, have a um, parent work. And again, no parent work. So in, in the case of uh, the Ninth Symphony by Beethoven, you would simply have Symphony Number no. 9 in D minor, Opus 125. And together, the formal title and the grouping title, you then add the composer name, gives all the information necessary. Or, as I said, the DSP could simply use the display title, which is these three bits there in, in red, blue and green, pre-compiled so that everything is in, in one place. Good. Let's move on. It's not just that we need to know what the title is. We also need to know the people or groups of people that played on that piece of music and who wrote that piece of music. So anybody who contributed to the work, anybody who contributed to the recording, as well as, uh, um, as anybody uh, um, who just contributed any other way, so from the soloist to the tea lady, um, you can list, if you consider as a, as a group of musicians, that person contributed to a recording or contributed to a composition, you would list them you could list them and as you provide in an ERN message the roles they play the DSP can then decide which ones to show on their side and which ones to not show um, according to their their policies but in addition to those contributors the people who actually play in a piece of music you have display artists that's basically the brand names of those who who contribute in many cases, it's the same kind of people, and in examples that we'll show you in a bit, um, they are the same people. But conceptually, they're two different things. One is the name that you find on the front of the cover of art, and the other is actually the wetware, the person who, who sings or plays the, the violin or whatever it may be. Now, how does that work? <clears throat> Going back to the Ode to Joy, the fourth movement, you have a composer, you have a conductor, you have an orchestra, you have a choir, and you have, in this case, four soloists. All of them, one, two, three, four, eight, all eight of them will be contributors to that fourth movement. And in all likelihood, all of them are also display artists and display artist uh, names, therefore. Um, that is not different from any other release notification in, in, in the pop or jazz uh, genres. You would do exactly the same there. What, where there is a difference is that the composer must also be a display artist with the role set to the composer. That's that's a critical difference. Because in pop music, while a composer is certainly important, um, it's typically the, the, the people who front the stuff uh, in front of a microphone that are the, the big names. In classical music, not so much. The composer plays um, the, the, that role. Therefore, composer must have a display artist um, 
role and must be communicated as a display artist. And you can even say whether the the um, con uh, a composer should be displayed in the title or not. That's a recommendation that the record company can make to the DSP. Um, typically, it would be set to yes. So if you don't put that flag in, then that's the default. Yes, it should be displayed. But you can, as a label, say, well, in this case, I'm not not that sure that the composer should be um, should be mentioned. But there's one other complication in this case. Um, we said that we have comparatively little space for display for consumers. If you then want to add um, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart or um, Ludwig van Beethoven um, as the name for the for the composer as part of the display title, that's a waste of space, frankly. It would be much better if you just put the last name which means that a composer should, in virtually all cases, be provided in two different ways. The key name, in the Western world, that's the last name, Beethoven, and the full name, Ludwig van Beethoven, for example. Slightly falls to the wayside when you have um, people like Bach, because if you're just saying Bach, you don't know whether you're meaning Johann Sebastian Bach or Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach. But at least for those where, where there's only one famous member of the family, um, they need to be provided in. The, just the key name, just the last name and the full name. And that's really it. It's a fairly simple set of rules. Just put them here on one slide can be used that are comparatively easy to understand, com completely e comparatively easy to implement, both for senders and recipients. And then we can, um, we can start to actually provide data for classical music for different uh, sites quite easy. So what are the rules? And I'll go back and, and show you some XML um, in a moment. You want to list all the contributors and display artists in the party list. And make sure that the composer has a full name and a key name. Everybody else typically just is listed by a full name, but ideally with a key name. Collate all the title parts. The movement goes in the reference title, the concerto goes into the grouping title, uh, and then you have the um, composer name, ideally just the the name, you need to collect all those bits, assemble the bits into display title and display title text. And then you list all the contributors, display artists and the messages. And as I said, the composer needs a little bit of special treatment. And while you're at it, why not use the Mead, the Mead standard, for example, or even the Pi standard for richer metadata to communicate the epoch, keynotes, time signatures, instrumentation, all of those bits can be communicated using uh, the meat standard, and that's um, something uh, worth mind, uh, keeping in mind as well. So let's look at some XML. Um, sorry that I'm going to bore you with uh, some pointy brackets, but I think it will be self-explanatory. Please note, though, that um, these are while valid XML files, they're not valid in accordance with any of the DDEX ERN profiles. I've omitted some data because I wanted to focus on the classical issues. And the recording is an invention um, just to show, my, uh, show the, the, the classical issues. So don't try to find that recording um, in, in any of the shops. It won't exist. So let's have a look. So here is an ERN uh, a message. This is now in accordance with a draft of ERN 4.3. Only people within DDEX will have seen this, um, this XML schema because, as Mark has said, it's still a draft at this stage. But we uh, should be able to publish this uh, in the next couple of months. We are in the latest stage of, of ironing out one or two uh, small issues that we're having 
dealing with um, immersive audio mainly. And as all ERN messages, you have a message header. I'm not going to show that to you. There is no difference to, to, to the past there. But then you have the various parties. And this again is the, the um, ninth symphony, and I've put two recordings in the third and the fourth movement. Um, so which parties do you need? Well, you certainly need the composer with a full name and a key name. And I would always, always recommend to add a party ID, a proper party ID, such as an ISNI in there. So here is an ISNI. Now everybody knows who we're talking about. You then have the conductor, you have the orchestra, and you have the um, choir. And then you have the individual um, soloists, the soprano, the alto, the um, baritone, and the bass. I assume that that's the order. I'm not sure. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, you because that's what the your own message needs, you need to say what, what the label is that puts out that uh, our fictitious uh, recording. And then you need to describe the individual resources. Well, as I said, I just put two recordings in, the first being the third movement. So it's a music, musical work sound recording. Pretty much all of them are. Uh, this sound recording edition, that's something new in ERN 4.3 to handle immersive audio, but it's just here. We need an ISRC. Uh, we have, have an identifier. And now we have three different display titles. That's the display title as the label suggests it to be provided. Just for, for giggles, I put it in here as an, in three different languages. Um, I would recommend to put it in all those languages which markets you want to uh, reach. And here I've just put it in English, in German, um, and in Japanese. Uh, mind you, the Japanese, I just copy pasted it from Wikipedia, so I have no idea whether that is actual, um, the actual uh, title. And for simplicity reason, I'm now just showing the English um, for the rest of this XML, um, but you would typically have all the different languages for all the different tags, including, incidentally, um, you may want to have the, the full name of those in different scripts if that is needed. The standard certainly supports it. So you have the display title text and the display title, which in this case is exactly the same because we don't have any subtitles, or version titles. So that's as per normal ERN rules. And then we have those two extra titles, the grouping title, as I've called it, and the formal title of the movement, Symphony Number no. 9 in D minor, Opus 125, and uh, Adagio Molto e Cantibili. And then we can have the um, display artists. Party one is the composer. And here you see the display artist role of the composer as a display artist. So here we're saying to the DSP, P1, that was the, the uh, that was Beethoven, please use him as the display composer. Where's the others? P2, that's the uh, conductor. P3, the um, orchestra are the only other contributors to the third movement because the, all the, the singing only happens in the fourth movement. So those are not con contributors or display artists on that sound recording. And then you have the um, contributors with their relevant roles. One is a composer, one is a conductor, and one is an orchestra. And that provides all the classical information. What you could also do, which I haven't done, is you can here add um, a catalog number. Oh, it's on the musical work. 
I can't remember at the moment where to put the um, the opus number, for example, in there. Um, we will put the video up on the on the website, um, and I will put a little uh, XML snippet um, in that video showing how to communicate the opus number and potentially a catalog number, compose a catalog number, which for Beethoven's works doesn't really exist, at least not not, not one common one. Um, so that's why it's never shown on, on this example, but I'll show how to do that in the video. So if you watch back, you will be able to see that. The second recording looks remarkably similar, except you may now have a longer display artist name. That's just, just all of the, the people in there. That's how the, DS, the, the record company wants to, to show this. That's the string, how they can provide it. And you now have four additional display artists, just showing one, P6, that's one of the four um, soloists. And you have all the contributors here, um, composer, conductor, orchestra, choir, and the four soloists. Otherwise, well, same as, it's a normal ERN message. And last but not least, you will then put this all into an album, um, barcode or whatever identifier you have, and you have a display title. Let's just call it Beethoven's Ninth, Life from the Royal Albert Hall. So here we have a display title and a subtitle split into two different bits. Display artist name would, I guess, be the same as for the fourth movement because that includes all the soloists you have all the display artists as before you have a label that you that you provide the genre text well i guess that is would be classical and there you have an ern message that communicates the classical bits as it should be communicated all the other release notes uh, uh, or release rules from the release profiles i haven't uh, catered for here. But I said you, we could also send some mead message. So here is a mead message that could accompany that ERN message. Mead message, mead is the standard for the media enrichment um, and description. So it gives richer information about sound recordings, works, um, and releases. In this case, let's talk about the fourth movement, the recording of the fourth movement. Um, but equally, you could use the PI message, the party information uh, enrichment standard to provide information about Beethoven, any of the orchestras uh, or choir or any of the soloists if you wanted. And they can be communicated either by a record company accompanying an ERN message, go together as one package, ERN message or the, the MP3 files or whatever the, the sound recording comes in, as well as a Mead and, and a Pi message. Um, or they can come from, from third party providers. But what can, can they provide in this case? And I've just put a couple of things in here. Um, you need to first describe, hey, what are we talking about? We're talking about the ISRC of that second track and you provide a display title so that somebody can match it to their internal systems. Now we're knowing what we're talking about. Oops, sorry. And you can have things like the time signature. Well, it's it's in 4-4. Four, four. And it's in 140 beats per minute. Slightly odd to talk about classical music about beats per minute, but yeah, it's a that's a valid piece of information. It's of quite high intensity. And it's in D. And it's upbeat, which is in this case is user-defined value because upbeat is not a not an, a DDEX standard, but there are um, 20, 30 values that you can use. What's the theme? Well, there are two themes that I could think of, friendship and peace. Where is it used? Well, since 1985, it's the hymn of the European Union. And it's the classical period. And 
alternative title is Ode to Joy, for example. Um, and I forgot the absolute pitch. The, um, the A above the middle C is in 442 hertz on that particular recording, for example. Um, so you can see that there's actually some kind of richer data that you can provide as a record company to, to a DSP or as a metadata service provider to a DSP that can enrich the, the, the user experience. Mead and Pi provide a whole raft of additional information, but there's, there's just some that I wanted to highlight here. So that's the, the XML. The only other thing that I wanted to, um, to mention and finish off is how does that all relate to other standards? The quick answer, the simple answer is it doesn't really, because the other standards don't need to know all of, of that kind of information that we've talked about. That information is mainly for the benefit of DSPs and their communities and their users so that they can better market the stuff um, and get the stuff across. All the common rules about music using ERN, using other standards, they apply to all the other standards. So do you still need to provide a composer for jazz and, and pop music? Well, in, in DSR, for example, yes, that's a common rule of the DSR standard, always provide the composers if you know of them. Well, in this case, if, if the DSP knows the composer because they're being sent the composer, because it's classical music, well, provide it in the DSR. So there's no, no addition rule, additional firm rule that DDEX has established. What I would say though, is that as the title, I would suggest to, to use the display title and display title text, because that contains all the, the pieces of information that somebody may actually need to, to ingest it. If, it's, if it goes to Music Rights Society or a publisher, well, that is the, the string they are most likely getting elsewhere. And in any case, they can extract the pieces of information so that they can match us to their, to their internal database in addition to identifiers and, and, and those kind of things. So that's kind of applies to all of those standards. Uh, and I apologize for the alphabet soup on the left-hand side. Well, that's all I had to, um, to talk about. I see a question um, or a comment from, from David on the, on the chat. Maybe David, you want to to speak to it rather than me reading it, that'll be boring. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a rather long comment. No need to read it all out, but it's just when you talked about other standards, including DSR, um, our main problem is a low auto match rate um, for classical music, and and there is a SISAC recommended formal title for classical works, which is very similar to what you've talked about. So it's the the form. The number, the key, the opus. So, for example, it would be concerto number two in D minor, op, opus 45 for violin and concerto. That's the kind of formal title structure, and there's no composer there. So, Beethoven would be in the composer field. It was just to say that although you talked about the display title just being passed on, it would be interesting if we could maybe consider whether a DSP could with all that information they're getting in an ERN, give us something that looks more like the formal title for a works registration. It's just a, a thought really, if that was uh, worth discussing at some point. But... That's certainly something we can we can raise in the, um, in the DSR working group that would look at after those things. I think the only difference there is the omission of the composer from, from that string. The rest is kind of, um, the same, isn't it? Pretty much, uh, yeah. I think so. Depending on, on yeah, the, the, the Opus 45 for violin and orchestra, whether that can be taken out or not, that might be more tricky from for a DSP because they don't receive that information separated out, at least not in an um, 
and an ERN message mm -hmm. in con conjunction with the, the Mead message, where you can then have the instrumentation shown that how that works for um, for Mead. But there you can certainly do split them out. But the composer could certainly be be left out. That's that's a rule that the the DSR working group could could consider. Um, as you and I are both going to those meetings, we can certainly raise them there. Okay, thanks. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, yes, here's York speaking. Hi, uh, uh, Hi, how are you doing? Fine, uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm just referring to uh, a situation where uh, the work is is the same, and the, for, for instance, the conductor will stay the same. But uh, uh, imagine that Herbert von Karajan has recorded a, 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 a Beethoven concerto, but he did one version before the digital age, before the CD, and one version with the same works and with, with, with the Berlin Philharmonics, or, or the same interpreters, uh, in the CD area. So how could you, how uh, do you distinguish them very clearly through meat? Or through through the ISRC, or uh, what? How would you uh, distinguish those uh, different versions from the same interpreters and the same in, version? In the ERN message, and I haven't shown that because I focus on those things that are different from from for for classical and for um, for pop music. There's always an original. Um, release or publication date so you would have on um on those two recordings one would be i don't know 1983 and one would be 1997 uh, or something like that as as the release date so you would be able to to differentiate them through that from the title and what you would show a consumer immediately um that may be more tricky. Um, but the there ISRC is no, would no... be different. So say again, and, and the, the ISRC, ISRC would certainly be different as well. Yeah. So from there, you could then go back to the to the reference metadata of the uh, ISRC. Um, yeah, but but the con consumer, you know, the consumer is looking for a special recording. Uh, Karian did maybe four versions of the same work through his lifetime, and he wants exactly okay this from 1954. How how could he find it then? It's maybe. Well, um, so if the if the um, if the DSPs allow the the release date or the the publication date of that recording to be searchable on their site then that is something they they you could use on that on that front so the data would be in the message whether it becomes usable on a dsp's site is is as a second step there is a second thing which ddex is currently working on though in all likelihood um those two recordings would happen in different places uh Therefore, um, having um, or ascribing a venue to that recording might be something that is, is quite helpful. Um, DDEX, as some of you might know, is working with the folks from IDA, which is the standards and identifiers for the film and, and movie industries, to, to establish a system for the identification of venues. We're still in the in the proof of concept phase at this at this stage, but that may at some stage in the future help to identify. Well, that's the recording that they did in in the Sydney Opera House, and that's the one they did in the in the Royal um, Royal Albert Hall or wherever the venue may be. Um, in addition to the the date, but again, unless a DSP uh, enables people to show this data and search this data, consumer will not benefit from this other than seeing it potentially on the on a DSP's little window that shows the, the credits. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, 
Um, well, thank you all for attending. Um, thank you, Niels, for all that uh, information. Um, a recording of this will um, be on our website in the in the next couple of days or so. Um, if, should you want to uh, look at it again, and um, we will be doing some more webinars during the course of this year, uh, so please keep a, an eye out for that as well. So uh, thank you all very much, and for now, uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye.